Hi, I'm Jeff Opperman. I work for the Nature Conservancy as a freshwater scientist, part of a team that focuses on protecting and restoring rivers around the world. A surprisingly important part of my job comes from collecting stories from people. And these might be insights that can help us do our job better, or they might be ideas that are particularly effective at communicating the importance or the urgency or the complexity of the job that we do. And these stories could come from a scientist, they could come from someone at the World Bank, but I don't just work for a conservation organization, I play guitar and I, and I love music. And so these kind of insights can also come from surprising places, like a country music song. So the story that I'm gonna tell you today draws on all of those sources. A few years ago, I was traveling with my family down the Mekong River in Southeast Asia. The Mekong right now is at the epicenter of a great debate about the future of rivers. And the debate is, what is the greatest value of rivers? Is it to be free flowing and producing fish? Or is it to be dammed and producing hydropower? So on this trip, we were staying in a village in a fairly remote part of the country of Laos along the Mekong. And we were staying as a guest of the village headman. So we had just wrapped up dinner. We had pushed the plates to the center of the table and were leaning back and listening as that headman was telling stories about the river and talking about the big hydropower dam that was proposed for the Mekong right near his village. He was telling us how people from the village go down to the river and catch these big migratory fish, some of which have traveled hundreds of miles to get to that spot. So these are fish that are very vulnerable to having their migration blocked by dams. He also told us how the electricity from that dam won't go to the village or even really to the country of Laos, as almost all of it's going to be sold to Thailand. So Laos will get the revenue, but Thailand gets the energy. And as I was listening, it perfectly matched my expectations of what I would hear, because it echoed the common narrative about the Mekong. And that narrative is that there's this proliferation, this boom of hydropower dams. You see in the map all the red and green dots. And that this, this boom of dam construction is being driven by the insatiable hunger for energy from the growing cities of Southeast Asia. And all of these dams are going to have serious negative impacts on the world's largest and most important freshwater fishery and the tens of millions of people that depend on those fish for their food and livelihoods. And it's not just the Mekong. In fact, this is a common narrative that you hear about dams, rivers, and people. It's a common narrative that environmentalists use as they generally oppose dams. And in fact, the history of the environmental movement is interwoven with this narrative of battles against dams. And it's also a story that you hear again and again in culture and art. And so as I was listening to that village headman tell a story, I was hearing the lyrics of a song called Uncle Frank. Uncle Frank is basically a short story set to music, a thumbnail sketch that captures the essence of this debate about people and dams. So to help you understand it better, let's spend a little time with the drive-by truckers. With the power of the city, the drive-by truckers are an awesome band. A lot of people think that they're awesome, but I may be one of the only people that does so in part because they write songs about rivers and dams. So in their song, Uncle Frank, the title character is forced to leave his farm because of the rising waters of a reservoir that is pooling up behind a hydropower dam built by the Tennessee Valley Authority, or the TVA. Beginning in the Great Depression, the TVA built a system of hydropower dams on the Tennessee River and its tributaries to electrify the rural South. Now this song captures a lot of the criticisms against dams because, because dams tend to fragment rivers, they fill valleys, they flood farmland and, and communities, and they force people to leave. So in the song, Uncle Frank, the people that are forced to leave their homes are compensated and they're promised jobs and homes in the city. But for Uncle Frank, stability and employment don't come because really nothing in his life had prepared him for that big of a change. And at the end of the song, the promised jobs have not materialized. And meanwhile, doctors and lawyers are enjoying their new lakefront property around the reservoir and teaching their kids how to water ski. And this is what happens to Uncle Frank. He dies a solitary and self-inflicted death. Uncle Frank. 
Now, this is devastating vignette about Uncle Frank's suicide actually contains a very sophisticated critique of hydropower. And that is, even when people are compensated for when they are forced to move, just as they were in this song, that the social disruption is too great and that very often they do not uh, get back their standard of living. And moreover, social problems like suicide or divorce or alcoholism, all of those rise. Meanwhile, the primary beneficiaries of the new electricity are often those people that are better off to begin with, like people living in cities or the owners of, of factories or mines. And, and this song includes a reference to that. Uh, there's a lyric that says, we powered up the city with hydroelectric juice, and now we've got more electricity than we could ever use. In a sense, saying that the sacrifice made by people like Uncle Frank was for something that was frivolous or decadent. In short, rural people who depend on healthy rivers and river valleys lose, and the economic elites win. So this is the essence of the critique made against hydropower by environmental groups and social advocacy groups. And they essentially believe that it's almost impossible to build a, quote, good hydropower dam, one that can responsibly and equitably manage its impacts. And so as a result, they tend to oppose nearly all dams. They point to failed relocation programs, the loss of fisheries and riverside agriculture, and the unequal distribution of benefits. And that is the essence of the story you hear about the Mekong. So back to that dinner in Laos. So as the head man was telling me his story, I could hear echoes of Uncle Frank. But then I got up the nerve just to ask him directly, what do you think about these hydropower dams? Do you think that they're a good idea or, or a bad idea? And that's when he went off script. He said, well, we need development. And we were sitting there in this little pool of light and he made a circling gesture with his right hand and he pointed out to the absolute darkness that surrounded the rest of the village. He says, we need more electricity, we need dams, we need roads and bridges and hospitals and schools, we need everything. So that darkness that to me was so thrilling, but precisely because it was so rare in my life, to him, that darkness was just a nightly remi reminder of the distance between his world and mine, and a reminder that the generator only worked for a few hours each night. So he didn't see dams as part of this great debate about the future of rivers and energy. He just saw them as part of a general overall process of development that he desperately wanted to see happen for him, for his village, and for his country. He did want to see the fish stay in the river, but for him, the narrative behind Uncle Frank was too simple. He, he had a different story to tell about dams and people. But you know who else does not agree with the drive-by truckers and has a different story to tell about dams and people? The drive-by truckers. So about 10 years after they released Uncle Frank, they came out with a song in which the narrator has a completely different view of hydropower dams, which is made clear in the chorus. Thank God for the TVA. That's right, the same TVA that killed Uncle Frank. In the first couple verses, the narrator talks about how he would spend time at Wilson, Wilson Dam, which is a, a TVA dam on the Tennessee River. And he would fish and hear his dad tell stories. And then later he took his girlfriend there. But the third verse reveals why the dam has importance, both real and symbolic, for the whole region. He starts by talking about how his grandfather grew up in absolute poverty, just a bunch of sharecroppers versus the world. Because of that poverty, his great-grandmother sat down and wrote a letter to FDR. It was a plea for help, and it joined a chorus of pleas for help that were coming at that time for the government to help people. And because of that, it set forth a chain of events that led to a couple county men coming up and asking his great-grandfather to join them and help building dams for the TVA, dams that would eventually transform the South. He helped build the dam, gave power to most of the South. So I thank God for the two. songs are not incompatible. They're both true, they're just told from very different perspectives. The music behind Uncle Frank burns with an, the anger of an individual that's been wronged, whereas the music behind TVA is sweeping and reverent, almost like an anthem for the whole South. If you were a person that was forced to move, like Anc Uncle Frank, there was a very good chance that your life would get worse. But the narrator for TVA looks back across the sweep of decades and generations and celebrates uh, the movement of a whole region from poverty to prosperity. So this leads me to ask a question that probably hasn't been asked all that often. How can our river conservation strategy 
be informed by the drive-by truckers. Simply put, I'd say if they can write songs with great sincerity about different perspectives of this issue, if they can embrace complexity, why can't we? And taking a break from being an amateur music critic here and to my actual job, the science actually supports that notion of complexity as well. There are clear data that show that the Uncle Frank story is all too true, that generally speaking, people who are displaced by dams do not reattain their standard of living and suffer social problems, and clear data that show the, the serious impacts that dams have on rivers and ecosystems. But there are also clear data that show the strong correlation between a country's level of development of infrastructure, such as dams, and their per capita wealth and all that goes with it in terms of access to health care, education, transportation, and job opportunities. It would be easier to pick one song or the other, or to pick one narrative about dams or the other and just stick with it, to see the world through the eyes of Uncle Frank and oppose all dams, or to see the world through the lens of TVA and to argue that river development and dams will always ultimately lift a region up. But I think the most effective strategies are going to emerge from embracing complexity, from taking the, the hard realities out of each narrative and crafting a strategy to deal with a complicated world that is pragmatic and flexible. There definitely are dams that should be opposed, dams that have unacceptable impacts on people or rivers or other places. But we also have to structure our river conservation strategy to take into account those very real aspirations for development that people have in places like Laos. In developing countries like Laos, the per capita electricity consumption could be from one quarter to one one hundredth that of the United States. And so a river conservation strategy that relies primarily on opposing hydropower dams will at best fall on deaf ears and at worst will land with a thud of hypocrisy, particularly if it's coming from a scientist or an advocate from the world's wealthiest country and a country notable for being among the leaders of damming its own rivers. To be successful, a river conservation strategy in a place like Laos or other countries needs to take into account the complex aspirations of that village headman. And I say complex because he did not have a strictly TVA perspective. Sure, he did want regional development to happen, yes, but he clearly wanted the fish to stay in the river. He knew that his village could suffer short-term disruption from that loss. He did not want an Uncle Frank future for his village. But already in the Mekong, there are hundreds of thousands of people facing that kind of disruption. And of all the dams, or most of the dams that you see here, all the red dots, if they're all built, there will be tens of millions of more people facing that kind of future. So the optimistic TVA outlook is not really possible with that scale of loss and disruption. There has to be a better way. So the research from our team, the work of our team, is focused on delivering the science that can illuminate that better way. There are pathways in which hydropower can contribute to regional development goals and energy expansion, but to do it in a way that has much better and more balanced outcomes for communities and healthy rivers. But to find those pathways, it requires really careful planning to look across a whole range of values and resources and come up with a plan, a system that will work across those values. It means avoiding dams in the places that have the highest impacts and protecting the areas that are the most vulnerable or most valuable. It means ensuring that communities have a real voice in this process and that, they're, and that they have a real stake and share in the benefits. And it means building and operating dams according to the best practices. There is research right now that shows that there's a future path for the Mekong in which a subset of those dams are built that provide a sizable portion of the total available energy but do that in a way that enough free-flowing river is left to maintain a healthy ecosystem, one that has the potential to support a productive fishery and all the food and livelihood benefits that go with it. In fact, our research is showing that in river basins around the world facing this same pressure from hydropower, that these sort of balanced outcomes are possible. And it underscores the need for governments and companies, communities and conservation organizations to work together to define what is possible. An inspiration for what is possible comes from a river in Maine called the Penobscot. In this river, for more than a century, a series of hydropower dams had blocked access to the biggest run of Atlantic salmon in the United States and 11 other migratory fish. Then, in a breakthrough agreement just a few years ago, a hydropower company, the Penobscot Indian Nation, government agencies and conservation organizations worked together to broker agreement. And in that agreement, three hydropower projects will re be removed. You can see the removal of uh, Viesi Dam here. 
And by removing those dams, it'll open up a thousand miles more of habitat for migratory fish, transforming how the basin works for those fish and for the people that depend on them. But because of operational and equipment changes at the dams that remain in the Penobscot, the river basin will produce as much electricity after dam removal as it did before. Now, I don't pretend that these kind of balanced outcomes are going to be easy. The work is going to be very hard, and very often the outcomes that we achieve are going to be far from perfect in terms of achieving that kind of balance. But however, one day, I think that the drive-by truckers could write a song about integrating the mitigation hierarchy into system-scale hydropower management to ensure conservation of rural communities and biodiversity. But I admit it's going to be really hard to work the required references to whiskey into those lyrics. And in fact, it may require drinking a lot of whiskey to write those lyrics. But I do think that one day, the drive-by truckers or some other band could write a song about the return of the salmon through the eyes of a, of a Penobscot. And that could join a trilogy of songs that started with Uncle Frank and TVA and serve as the concluding anthem of what's possible when we work in that complicated middle. Thank you. Thank you.